The following KQED production was produced in high definition. When people think of natural history, they often picture walking through a museum surrounded by massive skeletons of long extinct animals. But natural history is all around us, if you know where to look. On the windswept Sonoma coast, a large craggy knot of boulders rises 60 feet above the grassy plain. This towering outcrop of blue schist rock holds a secret and tells an ancient story. Right now it's a mystery and I love mysteries. These rocks personally are telling me something and it's telling me that we don't know everything that we think we know. Breck Parkman is the senior archeologist for the California State Parks Department. He has been studying these rocks for years. In 2001, he and colleague Raj Naidu were taking a break out of the wind when they noticed something they'd never seen before. The more we looked, especially over here, we started looking at the polish. And my friend, the paleontologist, is trained in geology, and I've looked at a lot of rocks around the world myself, and it came to our uh, attention that this polish was unique. And between the two of us, probably 60 years together uh, in the profession, had never seen polish like this before. We kind of looked at each other, and we came to the same conclusion at the exact same time, and said it's animal polish. The difficulty with it being animal polish, though, is that the polish goes up 14 feet. And you start thinking about, well, what animal could polish a rock 14 feet up in the air? And we started thinking about past animals, extinct animals like the mammoth. For more than a million years, this area was the home of the Colombian mammoth. A larger and less hairy cousin of the woolly mammoth, Colombian mammoths roamed all over lower North America. These rocks help tell their story. This is the Pleistocene, the last glacial maximum a time known as the Ice Age, an era that most modern Californians would find unimaginable. So you think about wildlife in the Bay Area. You've got mule deer, you've got coyotes, occasionally mountain lions. You go back to 15,000 years ago, then things get completely wild. You have mammoth, mastodon, two different species of saber-toothed cats, dire wolves, American lions, short-faced bear. There are camels, there's llamas. There is this huge diversity of big mammals that we call the megafauna. You can make a comparison with Africa now and San Francisco, the Bay Area, 12, 15,000 years ago. It must have been absolutely spectacular having this incredible diversity of mammals with these absolutely gigantic creatures that were roaming the earth where we stand today. Surprisingly, the Ice Age climate in the Bay Area is very similar to what we have today, warm, dry summers and cool, wet winters. But further north, it's freezing, and that's affecting the whole planet. Ocean waters are trapped in the massive polar ice sheets, causing the sea level to drop hundreds of feet. This exposes a broad expanse along our coastline Parkman calls the Farallon Plain. So if we were here 20,000 years ago, you wouldn't hear the, the waves hitting the shore because the beach was 12 miles further out. Instead of looking at the ocean, you'd be looking at a broad, expansive plain covered with grass and sedges and some trees, but just teeming with life, absolutely teeming with life. The San Francisco Bay also disappears, and in its place, a lush green valley. Here, the massive California River roars through a low break in the coastal range we now call the Golden Gate. During the summer migration, the grasslands overflow with life. Imagine all these herds of animals living in what's now San Francisco Bay, which was a dry valley at the time, going out to the coast. They would have gone right down the river. They followed the river right out through the Golden Gate onto the same Farallon Plain. I've looked at the migration routes, and that's where we tend to find a lot of these fossils of bison and mammoth. Evidence and remains of these animals have been found all over California. This is Smilodon californicus. This is our state fossil, believe it or not. Most people don't know we have a state fossil, but this is it. This is the saber-toothed cat. 
And this is a very enigmatic species. It's one that visually characterizes the Pleistocene. It's, it's one of these species that's no longer found anywhere on the planet today, but was very abundant in California. This is the skull of the Harlan's ground sloth, one of the medium-sized ground sloths that lived uh, in the Bay Area. This animal here, probably about nine feet long, maybe six to 800 pounds as an adult. This is a California record black bear. It weighed well over 600 pounds. It was a very, very large black bear. So this being a reference point, probably one of the largest black bears I've ever seen and that anybody else might see. Compare that with this other member of the Pleistocene megafauna. This is a short-faced bear. This is the largest terrestrial carnivore that ever lived in North America. It was absolutely massive, at least 25% larger than a grizzly bear. It was a, a sprinting animal that could probably do at least 40 miles per hour over at least a mile flat. It chased down camels, llamas, horses, antelope. It was one of the most super of the super predators that we had in North America. Absolutely fantastically gigantic. It stood uh, uh, at least up to 13 feet tall. If I was one of the first North Americans, this would be my nightmare. So with these, this incredible diversity of wildlife, just think if you were one of the first people to come here, you've crossed over the Bering Land Bridge from Asia, you've made it down probably the west coast of North America, or maybe you've cut through a big divide between the major glaciers, you would have encountered all of these animals, the, the, the mammoth, the mastodon, all the bison, the giant ground sloths, and those carnivores, the American lion, the short-faced bear. As scary as it must have been, when those first people arrived in the Pleistocene Bay Area, they found an absolute Eden. Right where I stand, there could have been a mammoth that was nursing its young. There could have been a short-faced bear that was feeding on the carcass of a giant western camel. There could have been a, um, you know, saber-toothed kittens, you know, smacking around a pine cone, just playing. You, wherever you were in the Bay Area, there was that megafauna. San Francisco, Oakland, San Jose, Walnut Creek, all those animals live there, and their remains are buried underneath where you're standing. Back at the rubbing rocks, Parkman is looking at the evidence he's found above ground and learning more about how these animals live. We're standing in a larger sort of open area here, surrounded by rock on most sides. I can picture a herd of mammoth in here, hanging out on windy days. This entire area is so heavily polished, especially the rocks over there. So this is certainly my favorite rock, I believe, of all of them. And it's actually the rock that gave me the most, most insight into the fact that we have animals polished in the rock of everything I saw here. It's all heavily polished. A little, see, just there's a little bit left there. And this actually goes up 396 centimeters from the current day surface of the ground. 396 centimeters from the surface is getting you back into the neighborhood of the shoulder height of a big mammoth, about 14 feet. This rock is uh, so important in the health of a mammoth community because what the mammoth was doing in getting coated in mud, uh, it was removing all the ectoparasites from its body. And then just before it completely dries, you come over to this rock and you rub, and you're rubbing that mud off. And with that mud go all the, the parasites that were on your body that day. And there was probably a line of mammoths standing in line to do that. But there were thousands and thousands and thousands of generations of animals used in this area. Over time, the largeness of that animal and the power of that animal and the clays that would have been in the mud combined to polish these rocks on a grand scale. Parkman and his team have analyzed the polish under an atomic force microscope, conclusively ruling out wind, water, and other geologic explanations. What it does resemble are rocks polished by modern elephants. But even with this evidence, many scientists need to see it with their own eyes. A lot of scientists come out from different fields. And what I've seen over the last seven years is that most people, at least that are scientifically trained, when I tell them about this polish, they automatically start thinking, what can it be other than mammoth and bison? So I've heard people say it's got to be wind. Other people say it has to be water. Obviously it has to be water because what you're describing sounds like water polish. And then some people uh, say it has to be from faulting. So it has to be rocks moving against rocks. Well, it's none of that. Once people come out to the site, they go away saying the same thing I'm going away saying is that mammoth is the only thing that makes sense. 
What remains a mystery is what happened to all those big animals. Was it the arrival of humans that led to their demise? Or was it global warming that raised sea levels and eliminated the coastal habitat? That's the question that nobody really knows. The two prevailing theories are either climatic change or what's called the overhunting hypothesis or overkill hypothesis. Or was it the combination of both of them? It's difficult to know, and that's why so many people are interested in the Pleistocene in this last 20,000 years to try to unravel climatic change in human interaction because maybe we could apply some of those ideas to the global change that's going to be happening over the next 50, 100, 200 years. It's something to think about as we walk through our natural history museums. The actions we take today are going to play a role in which skeletons are on display in the future. Thinking about all these massive, gigantic, incredibly cool mammals that used to live here side by side, it really brings up our guard that we need to protect what we still have. We need to protect enough wild lands to support the wildlife we still have. Keep Quest free. Discover more and donate at kqed.org quest.